buying a plot can be easy or maybe a tedious task sometimes, especially when you have so many real estate companies, agents, landowners, and even sometimes so-called landlords all calling to buy their properties. Getting the land is the easiest part, but owning the land with genuine documentation is the problem. We have seen unprecedented court cases of people going to court to settle land issues. If you are looking to buy a plot or a build home with no risk of stress, guys, look for the right real estate company. At EJ Investments, we don't just sell plots, we build communities. Where any plot you buy from us comes with access to water, electricity, internal roads and other social amenities. We guarantee you genuine contract documentations the moment you pay a deposit and a complete handover of your title deeds as soon as completing payment. We currently operate three projects in strategic locations, selling service plots and built homes in our estate to Jering Seafront, Sanyang Seaview Estate and our Gunjur Seafront Coastal Highway Estates. Our plots are affordable from only $90,000 you can own a home at Agunjo C4 Coastal Highway Estate and from $200,000 you can own a home of your dream at our Sanyang C View and Lake View Estate. Our two Jering Seafront Estate starts from $300,000. Plot sizes ranges from 20 by 20, 20 by 25 and 25 by 25 and we offer an option of 30% deposit and two-year payment plans on our, our estates. A beautiful home with peaceful and happy neighborhood awaits you at our project to during Seafront Estate, Signing Seaview and Lakeview Estate and Gundu Stifo Coastal Highway Estate. Call our office on 4464838 or 3021056, which is also on WhatsApp. Email us or visit our website on ejinvestments.net to learn more about our projects. EJ Investments, we're fast in property. Standard newspaper and our very own Mustafa K. Dabo will be taking us to um, the Kirpatu website. Welcome, gentlemen, and yes. Happy New Year to both of you. Thank you very much uh, for having us, and thank you very much to our viewers uh, all around the world, and Happy New Year to you. Thank you very much. Today's episode is a special one because uh, we have a very special guest here, but I'll keep uh, you on a little wait so you can. Um, you can keep clinging on your screen. So today, Mr. Lamicham is going to take us through what has been happening on the newspaper over the week, and also will share more light of, on some of the information that have been got. Lamin? Thank you, Joy. Well, since we've been here, it's been one year, could you believe? Yes. <laughs> well, actually, literally, it's just been a, couple, a little over two weeks, but it was a, you know, an old year, and then we have into a new year. So yeah. Yeah. it's been a year. So, and within that time, <laughs> can you believe a lot of things have happened? Um, but we're going to confine ourselves to the most interesting articles and headlines that attracted uh, my attention, of course. And and that is the hirings and firings around the presidency. What do they speak of our politics today? And uh, all the parties have now had their biannual uh, national congresses. We dealt with the UDP and APRC extensively in the past two weeks. Right. But there are still some talking points in the parties that have theirs just recently, particularly the PPP and the GDC, which has to replace almost entirely 80% of its executive and feuding parties in the NCP. So all those uh, are topics that we will discuss. Mr. what do you have for the Kerala party? Um, well, I'm so would uh, talk uh, briefly about um, the remains of December 30th attackers, which is going to be given <coughs> to their family members. 
on Wednesday, uh, of course, this was um, communicated to the media by Justice Ministry yesterday. Um, you people could not have published that. Yeah. Um, and also, I mean, Chinese um, foreign minister is going to be here today. Yeah. Um, so the significance of that visit, we all know, it's, uh, given the time, given the timing, and Chinese are about to build two bridges and two roads in one of the most crucial areas in the country. Uh, it's highly significant, and I think we could also briefly talk about uh, the anticipation that Tal may have come to Al Tal, the fired legal advisor of uh, the OIC. Yeah. Okay. We, 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 uh, I, I hope we will delve into that too. Uh, that, that and many others we will look into from the. So. Without much ado, um, all the parties have now have their annual congress, and the latest to do is the People's Progressive Party, Joyce. The People's Progressive Party really have a, uh, quite an important place in the history of the Gambia, because um, it was the party that led the Gambia to independence and uh, you know, set up uh, most of the structures that uh, the nation was built on, and we know they were toppled in 1994 and to uh, bring in the, the, uh, the Jame regime uh, which has been much criticized for a lot of whole lot of things right and now with the advent of the new republic all the parties old and new have been busy reviving themselves and this <laughs> congress 17 years since the last one was held when the ban was lifted uh, in 2001 this Congress was meant to provide the opportunity for the PPP to get itself well revived and join in the political fold. Um, in the, of course, in the now very, very free environment and very, we hope, leveled field. Now, there was much expectation because, I mean, the party's uh, history, like I said, is, is really quite significant. And the players there, too, were also people who are strong personalities in government politics uh, uh, in, the, in the early years of independence and a little decades after. But what it turned out to be was um, um, the PPP's future actually has not been clouded, so to speak, by many observers who went there. Uh, in, the, in the fact that um, uh, the, the, the elections that ensued after <coughs> you know, the two days of deliberations ended in the election of Papanjai. Mm -hmm. Now, Papanjai polled 272 against uh, 227, I, said, I guess, of Bakari Dabo, was seen as really a big shock to many, including neutrals, who actually may not be PPP, but uh, they believe in the personality of uh, Bakari Dabo. I mean, they felt that Bakari Dabo, uh, given his experience and credibility, because during the First Republic, he was among, among the most respected politicians. Uh, in the Gambia, um, given his, you know, experience and standing as a respectable personality, people believe he probably had a better opportunity to revive and give the PPP much respect, uh, you know, whoever is dealing with them in the future, and perhaps his connection to the rural areas, because you know the PPP historically drew its support from the protectorate. It was actually the protectorate who, you know, put into power. So they believe Bakari had that connection and the credibility and probably can relate with the people over there and then, you know, give much respect and, you know, we can translate into support. Absolutely. That will make them, uh, I mean, a very integral part of any political power who wants to absorb them or to get their support, etc. Now, the delegates at the conference thought otherwise. Um, they elected a young, probably not quite terrifically known, until the last mayor elections, Papanjaya, when he threw his heart, at first, you know, he wanted to go for the UDP. When he realized uh, they wouldn't pick him, um, he said he, he went into in the, to, to, to independence, and we know how what happened. So he only came to light politically in the past year or so when he was a mayor candidate. He's not quite well known beyond um, beyond the Greater Banjul area, so to speak. So he was elected, but later we heard that. Uh, uh, the party, senior officers of the party, because because this side, the, there were two sides. There's Oye, who must be credited for keeping the 
you know, the party alive over the last uh, 22 years under, you know, horrible conditions. And he had to go to jail, he had to, uh, I mean, endure a lot of harassment from Jamme. And he kept the party alive all these years. So you have to give him much credit for that. But uh, the Congress, he was perceived to be supporting Papanjai. And then that really put him parallel uh, to the ambitions and aspirations of the senior members of the party, in the likes of Alhaji Yaya Sise, who uh, was the national president, Kaliru Singhari, who was a cabinet minister and uh, quite an influential figure in the First Republic, um, as well as uh, Amaru Tal, who uh, used to be MP for Banjil Saur and a senior member of the party, was also ambassador. This the senior guys are perceived to be supporting Bakari Davos candidates. And like I told you, most neutrals actually <coughs> wanted Bakari Davos uh, to one. Now, the question is, uh, Mustafa, uh, in your perspective, many commentaries like headlines and uh, screen, I like PPP commits political suicide, PPP has gone to the docks, I'm out, etc., etc. Mm. And others which said, well, PPP perhaps are in, you know, in the good hands because unlike other parties, it has gone to the younger generation. What do you take out from that? In my opinion, I think politics is like any other context. Your chances of success are enhanced when your opponents fear you. And if you ask me, Baba and B Papa and Bibi, um, who does the opponents fear? I would tell you UDP doesn't want Bibi elected. Because if Bibi is elected, they are likely to take, he is likely to take the kings from them. At least mm. Bibi has a constituency that he threatened, a formidable political force, mm. that I can take this from you. And he, he is quite measured when I attended his press conference, the last one, because when he was talking, he said, when I went around the country, I've looked around our support base and I realized how much we have lost. Mm -hmm. And I know it's not going to be easy to win it over. So, so you could see he's, he's, he's admitted the loss and, and he's someone and who is prepared to fight for it. And this loss it. was to the UDP. Yes, yes. Mm. This loss was to the UDP. And also come to think of all the, the hype around BB. Who, who are they? They are people who are currently UDP. You understand? Now, uh, let's not also forget that no one can acquire political power from an existing power base unless you can break inside them. Mm. In other words, we were not able, we will never have been able to uproot Jambe and the APRC if the opposition could not have breaking into his support base. Yeah, so there were some who took from them. Mm. Now, in order for them to weaken uh, UDP, which is apparently the political, the biggest political power base right now, they would need to hack inside the UDP. And I think the right person to do that, mm -hmm. it's BB. I mean, if you look at Papa, Papa is good, he's young. Um, okay, BB also has some quite questionable uh, moral conducts in the past. Like uh, what? For instance, joining the junta. I mean, when he came back, oh, of course, he joined them for 70 days. You can say that. Ah, you can yeah. say that in his defense. But when BB joined the junta, Dambe uh, came to power with his brood. Yeah, he cannot. He cannot claim that he has, he does not see that side of him. No, but, but at a time. Because, yes, and I, I know his excuse no, when I time, asked the question was, no, well... Was, uh, at a time, he was asked this question. I remember when we were at the Daily Observer, when it happened. I mean, it was the junta mm. who recognized Bakri's cred credibility. Because, mm. I mean, like I told you, the First Republic, he was seen as the most credible. The junta recognized... I mean, his abilities and his uh, honesty. I know that. I, I know that's what he says in his defense. No, but what, what I am saying said, is, not that what he said. Jamme was quoted yeah. in the papers to have said that act only back at double. You know, could be the person he can work with because he felt that he was most credible. Yeah, but with what Jamme was seen to have. Now, back mm. felt at the time. Then now the country needed his advice, his service, and he came. I mean, 60 days later, he couldn't pull me down because he, by principle, they would not take his... They would not take well, his of course, you can say that. But while he was there, remember I, that I his told, colleagues, so his colleagues that, were no, also being tortured. No, to say that, to say that he shouldn't have come at all and joined them, 
What's, what's that? I mean, it may not be fair to him. You know? Yeah, but I'm saying... But but I feel that he came, and I'm sure he must have got word from Sadauda or consulted with Sadauda. No, 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 because Sadauda even did not approve this, because Sadauda said... How did well, he come to me? Because it? Sadauda said it in his book, Kairaba. Oh, okay. Be he said, uh -huh. he, he said, well, he said, this is how he cynically put it, uh, well, Bakari said he wants to go back and help his countrymen. Uh, that, but he but Sadauda, remember, Sadauda was moving from one village to another, one city to another, one country to another, condemning the coup and condemning the military and trying to mobilize international force against him. That, that was well into, that was well after him. I mean, that uh, that, was, but that was within the 70 days. What Sadauda was doing at the time, what, I mean, Sadauda didn't want the coup, uh, I mean, to grow roots yes. before intervention. Yes. I mean, yeah. He went to Ghana, he went to Nigeria. Went, yes. I think he was unfortunate that his man in, in Babanjida, in Lagos, uh, Abu, was uh, not there. Was not in power. At yes. Time because he was Babanjida. I mean, and he was also he not in good books with Senegal. Yes. But the truth and, is. And he had already had very, very bad relations with Senegal yeah. from the 1981. But my point is, there are two points I have. But here. you can't blame Bakari uh -huh. for that decision to come and try to work with him. <laughs> okay, because let's, he, let's he, move he, on. Since we can't agree on that point. Move, let's move on to the NCP now. Um, this, is, this is your Badibu party. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe I will ask our special guest who also follows a lot of politics when he comes down here to say mm. one or two about these things. Um, that's a very good party. Mm. Now, over the last week, two headlines, Majan Kosam was elected, mm -hmm. and then three, four days later, a much more organized and bigger movement. Congress. Yes, happened. calling themselves the real NCP. Happened. Huh? Took place, and they said, they are the actual NCP, and, and, I, and, and they have every reason to say it because even founder Sheriff Mustafa Diba's wife, the widow, came there and, and, and actually threw his weight behind that faction of the NCP, led by Yaya yeah. Sanya. Yeah, yeah, Sanya. Now, what does this now, what, what picture can you paint out of this? Majanko is just yeah, denying well, the reality, he is no longer an NCP, a legitimate NCP leader. Yeah. Or, 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 or these people are just been rebellious. You know, Majango may have carried a lot of uh, history behind him as, you know, being UDP before. But, I mean, even his conduct in the National Assembly. Majango is not a very highly, in my opinion, astute politician who can who can do anything in the current political landscape in this country. Yeah, but the I mean, politics is, is changing... Is. I think the legitimacy is with the other one. Yeah, I mean, yeah. yes, because the legitimacy in this context comes with the number of people behind you. Because because when IEC probably is going to consider, they're going to consider, I mean, you you said that Sri Mustafa Diba's wife came there, and a lot of other PPP people who are seem to be highly loyal and NCP. with the history of the NCP were yeah. there also. Yeah. So you could see that legitimacy, in my opinion, uh, it's difficult to take sides here. But legitimacy, in my opinion, it's with uh, the Sanya. Yeah, Sanya yeah, guy. Yeah. So, um, Majanko, I don't think he, he has the clout. Uh, the, the, I, both PPP and NCP, it's hard to say, are a terribly missed opportunity. I mean, in terms of how you see them conduct the Congress and how they moved out of it, and, and the results that comes after the Congress. But and, the, 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 I mean, the, the, the PPP would not agree um, over the leadership. Um, NCP, which is a tragedy is because tragedy. it splits the but, party. But into hasn't gone yet to, um, to, to, to be the NCP director. It's completely split now. Um, yeah. You have, you have Majanko is still clinging on to the leadership of the PPP and uh, the NCP. And yeah, yeah, whose block is bigger, they're saying that they are the legitimate party, completely. Party. Yeah, now, so based on the coalition agreement, Majanko came to, 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 to participate in the coalition, whatever the cake, because he's been yeah. a nominated member of. Uh, yeah. National Assembly yeah. on the NCP ticket. Yeah. Supposing the IAC now recognizes the other the side, sign and factor, would Majango lose his? Politically, he is dead, and politicians don't they don't bank on anybody who is not relevant to them. It's as if, but, but, it's as if, but his position at the moment uh, depends on President Barrow. His President Barrow. Nominated. That's exactly what I'm saying. So and, and the moment he's kicked out of PPP, he becomes useless NCP. to he NCP. He becomes useless to Barrow. Because, because Barrow, I don't think he perhaps have a following. That's what I'm saying. And immediately he loses that, he becomes useless to Barrow. That means he can kick him out any time. It's as if Hamad is kicked out of NRP. He becomes useless to Barrow. <laughs> but somebody, Plumbi Vulcan, was, in fact, what, 
What support do they have in the first place? Well, I think they have a little. I mean, politics, there is no little support base. I mean, okay. every member at least comes with uh, two or three. Okay. So, you know, I mean, now, two or three. Let's three. move on to the GDC. Um, you know, 75% of their executive uh, all left uh, yeah. three or four months ago. Yeah. Now, everyone, everybody was watching what will happen. Um, mm -hmm. And there are Congress in Basse. Eh? Mm -hmm. um, there was very, very, very interesting development. Mm -hmm. um, they now pick their number two. As a woman? No, it's not a woman. It's probably a woman. Isn't it a woman? No. Boja. It's Vanda Boja. It's, 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 Vanda is a man. No. It's, I don't really know Vanda. No, okay, he is a man. He is friend, he's a brother to Dembo Vanda Boja, the, the writer uh, and who was in the lottery. Now this guy is, uh, is 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 really very respected in Brikama, and, mm. uh, yes. And look at the geopolitics of the country now. It's, it's now been considered as uh, GDC now trying to control Brikama, trying to get inroads into UDP's support, support Brikama by appointing somebody very respected, a community member. Uh, you know, from among the royals in Brikama, the voyants, if you like. <laughs> yeah. Now, <laughs> that's a strategy that UDP, uh, the GDC is come for. But yeah. do you think, even with this man, uh, because GDC's weakness actually has been the lack of support in the West Coast and, and in the Combos. And in the, and the, and, and in and, the and KMCs. KMCs. Yeah. Are they now trying to rectify this thing? by going I, I think so. I think so. I, I mean, I, I, even the last election we were saying this when we were on our platform, we were saying, GDC cannot form government in this country unless they can break Banjul, they can break KMC, they can break Combo. Yeah. And because this is where the larger number of voters are. Yes, if you can get grips of large amount of votes in these regions, in these areas, you can form a government. Is so that, I think having to organize a government, and, and this is not because they have not in the past had a... Remember their former deputy, uh, former deputy party leader, Mr. Mr. Gate. But then, of course, he was political. Mr. Gate, of course, yes. yes we agree on that, and we agree also. He has demonstrated to not have enough support in Bacau. I mean, yes, but, um, but but he was he was nevertheless native of this area, and he was he was he was based in Bacau. So let's see all in all what uh, what Mr. Fanta Boja can do for them. I think it's a good decision, and I think the Congress has been orderly because yeah. of all the parties that had gone to Congress. I mean, they are one of those who had had a successful Congress, and you know, there was no war after the Congress. Is that, is that perhaps because there is no democracy? There's one man. Well, well, uh, can they retain his uh, position as the leader of the UDP? But I wouldn't, uh, uh, GDC. But I wouldn't say that's not deserved because uh -huh. I mean, remember, he's the one who started the party, and over the year he there has proven no to have succeeded yeah. in terms of how much. Success support he was able to accumulate for the party. Yeah. Of course, there are some shortfalls, but you can't beat him squarely for that. Do I have theirs in Jen Sanya? Yeah, but um, there was no election. There, it was, there, 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 yeah. there was no, it wasn't expected. Um, uh, the election was supposed were, to be next year, I think. I suppose um, there, yeah. were, there, were, there were, however, renewals. Uh, resolutions. Resolutions and, yeah. and renewals for the party to continue yes. uh, in the struggle. And those, uh, could you believe, 32 years now or something like that. Yes. And uh, Syria Jatra um, mentioned something like uh, the old guys are getting nearer to their graves. It's time for now for the young ones uh, to, to take to take the mantle. Which is which is but, true. Uh, but do you see that happening soon? He, look, my problem with uh, people saying old people should go, young people should come is that uh, this is true. I mean, in the end, we will even old people will eventually leave. But let's not forget, these old people also have resources. Uh, come to think of it, how many people in PDYs can have greater command over issues like Salah and Sidia? Or more than Salah and Sidia? No, I'm not saying they but shouldn't step aside. No, I, no, 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 no. I, I would never say they shouldn't step aside. Mm. They can and they should step aside for young people to come. But also this has to take this has to happen gradually. 32 so years is not time enough. Yes, no, 32 years it's, it's good enough, but I mean, if you look at these old folks also, you look at the successors behind them, of course, I mean, uh, Usman Sela, it's good, Uncle Shwaibu, you know, they are young and they're vibrant, they can do something, you know, but, uh, you know, in terms of how robust they are, and their grip of, you know, on issues, they're not, 
Salah smart, you see this smart. I mean, so so you can see. Yeah, I, mean, no, I I think it will happen, but still now, uh, yeah. the, if I were them, we we can handle the the mantle of leadership. Like say, you can be the presidential candidates, you can be the candidates and the politicians, but we are always going to be behind to manage the party, man. Yeah, if I were them, this is the this is the way to go. We give the political like we will not contest as presidential candidates, as parliamentarians, as we'll this. But the party, we will run that. Mm. I think this is this is the better idea for PDIs. Good. Um, we go now to the hirings and firings um, over the last Christmas and New Year period. Um, how does this tell us now as to what 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 we what we can now take home between in in the in this in the matter between. President Barrow and uh, the United Democratic Party, their mm. public party, because it eventually it has seemingly seemed to uh, suggest that this is what is at play. Mm. Yusuf Achan, um, very much respected for being a UDP, mm. um, you know, UDP stalwart in the, um, in, in the, in the West Coast, um, who's credited to rally, Sane Mentring, um, Usumbala, Yundum constituencies for the UDP. We, if you followed his career over the last six months or so, there was a point when all this Barrow Youth Movement and this Barrow thing were all coming up, that he was initially accused... Perceived. Be, perceived. To have been on the other side. Yeah. To be uh, very much in support of President Barrow. Until mm. some UDP uh, people started calling for his head, so yeah. he was sacked. Yeah. We've seen dramatically, uh, I mean, he became to... To, to be considered to actually a real pure and blood UDP. When in the yeah. regional elections, came. He, he came back as chairman, uh, meaning that there was no longer any uh, any misgivings about him Absolutely. Uh, being a pure blooded UDP. Absolutely. Now, it looks like now, it looks from all um, from all angles that uh, wow, this is what this is what led to his sacking. Um, he no longer subscribed to the borough agenda. Um, or Barrow movement, etc. So Barrow didn't feel that he is actually his position is tenable around the president. So when he doesn't share uh, his vision or his ambition to uh, politically, yeah, yeah, I think so too. I mean, I think um, the dispute is becoming apparent. I mean, this is something we've been saying here over, right. over a year now. So now Dabo I mean, cannot say there's no problem. He could I mean, even explain that. He has long passed. He has long passed that mm -hmm. himself. He has admitted there are problems when yeah. he said, you know. We will not allow anyone to divide the party. But the, the truth is, the truth of the matter is, the question is, um, there are positives and there are negatives here. The positive is, if UDP is pushed into an opposition, that may also make the presidency, it, it, may, it may force Barrow to do, to do more. Because when you have a formidable opposition, the chances are that you will be they they will give you a, they will give you how, how do they call it they said uh, but, but they they would you, pressure you, you into you would yeah yeah they will have... pressure you into doing something positive mm. um, that's one thing but on another hand is does the borough have its borough astute is he that I mean smart to to to, to handle yeah. that kind of pressure I mean he may he may. My fear is he may slip and go into the jambe ways. I mean, uh, to be dictatorial. My, that's my fear, and you could see uh, the tone if you sabotage my national development. I'm beginning to call. Even uh, I, I did a story yesterday, and uh, on the uh, it was published on your newspaper. Yeah. And underneath the story, someone commented um, that that they've been following my work for some time, yeah. and it shows. I am X, Y, and Z. Yeah. So when you begin to, that's my fear. When yeah. when when people in power begins to look Six at nine. critics as, as opponents, opponents yeah. or journalists as open, oh, so that's they, dangerous. So they cultivate this fear and then they, they try yeah. to be on this. So that's where fear it's not good. Otherwise, I think it's a healthy. It's overall a healthy. What uh, about that of uh, Alma Metal? I mean. Uh, Alma Metal works for the Secretariat of the Organization of Islamic Conference, which, is, among other things, is going to host a summit here, and then there's mm. projects for infrastructure and other things there. 
But it's said that his sacking came from the presidency. Yeah. Is this is this okay? How can well, well it's, how, it came from the presidency. Yeah, is is, the, uh, is it okay? Because from all intents and purposes, all I see uh, is meant to be an independent um, yeah. institution that is uh, working on the Gambia's hosting of the yeah. or, um, Islamic summit. I think so. I mean, except that there are a lot of people who do not agree with it. But uh, I mean, uh, personally, I have no understanding of the law to take a position on this legally. But, but I would say the president's, in terms of hiring and firing, I mean, uh, there has to be justified it, it, reasons. It does this for political reasons. Of course. I mean, that's clear. Um, sorry, gentlemen, yes. I will have to cut us shut. It has been quite an insightful one, and I'm sure our viewers have as well learned and um, experienced a lot from uh, such a wonderful conversation. Over to you, Mr. Uh, K. Dabo. What do you have on Kate Fatu website? Yeah, so um, over the just yesterday, the, for the Justice Minister has uh, uh, issued a communication to inform media that uh, <clears throat> the remains of people who have died in the 2014 attack at the state house um they widely widely celebrated online and diaspora as uh, freedom fighters uh, their remains will be handed over to their family members uh, you remember some couple of people came to the state house uh, some of them were former soldiers u.s uh, mr J captain jaganjai uh, and Lamin Sani, I think, were the people who were killed. Uh, yeah, yeah, and, uh, and, uh, Lamin and Sani. Yeah. Lamin Sani and the other guy. Yeah. Who were killed. Yes. Um, in a gun battle. So, um, ah, the remains so will be given. Uh, yeah. Legacy. Yeah. So, yeah, that's what they claim. So, um, the remains will be, because they were exhumed by the police. Yeah, I wasn't. You were I was, there. I was in Tintimba. Yeah. We are near the river Gambe where the, the dead bodies were yeah. exhumed from the yes, yes, it was, it was really quite a, quite an emotional scene. It was, you know, I just still remember. But <coughs> at a time, uh, for, for many, uh, many months after that, the, what the government said was they had to determine um, the identity using forensic or scientific means to, to whether these are the actual remains of the. Mm -hmm. And that. That really sounds funny to the uh, to to the relatives who believe that well. Why did you check us to the first place? It was the jugglers who did the act who said this where they were buried, and you recovered it. But what more evidence do you need? Mm -hmm. What the attorney general, I mean, is just not telling us that do they now? They are sharing the identity. Yes, establish that these are absolutely true. because there were some couple of weeks ago there were some forensic scientists who had come from U.S. And you know, and help the people, these people identify the remains of these people, and also solo sanding and all this. So yeah, so they were identified, and uh, the remains will be given to the families for proper burial. I think it it must be a a, a day of relief. I mean, knowing and relief or uh, well, uh, at least more emotions. it's and going to be more emotions, but knowing system. also knowing also that at least. That's a closer to this. Yeah. Or no, at least yeah, that he's have dead and, and we are burying him. The circumstances, how they, they, how they, they are dead. The government of Yemen uh, claimed they were sh shot in action. They were they died in crossfire and they were trying to overthrow the government. When there are other theories that they probably might have been captured and shot and, and actually killed mm. in cold blood. All this has to be established. But yeah. do you think now it will at least uh, re lay? Uh, the emotional stress, distress that these relatives have been going through. Yeah, I think so. I think so. I mean, I, I, I think if, if, if one thing, this is what it does. I mean, if you know your relative is dead, at least you have a, a, a confirmation that he's dead, and you are given the remains, whatever it is, and you go and choose a place to, uh, to, to bury the person. I, I think that alone is at least a step forward I mean, mm. for the family. In my opinion, yeah. Like you said, um, th there are people who said, well, well, let's say the people trying to defend the, mm -hmm. uh, the, the defend the, the actions of mm -hmm. the former government. I mm -hmm. mean, Musa Savage, the general who mm -hmm. participated a lot in crossing the coup, was once called in the media. Said, um, I mean, the people, people actually were were rebels. They, yes, they were rebels. 
And a lot of people well, buy into this school of thought that these people died while they were trying to kill the president or they tried to overthrow the government. Well, they got what they deserve. Sorry, this this you this can message, say the same of Mandela anyway. To a lot of people, but the world is a know. weird place. You can say the same of Mandela. I mean, Mandela was was tempted so much that he had but trained to become a. Uh, have to establish exactly how the circumstances. Yes, absolutely. We can that that is them. also important. Exactly. That's important. Because that's what we should do. If actually they were they were arrested and then later killed, you know. So two two more that's, things. That's no again. explanation, but two more things. I mean, Papanjai, we've been talking about him. He actually went to see Sadauda over the week. Um, during the week, Papa and OJ were seen on social media, you know, PPP, it, it Facebook is. platform. It of course, is. I called him. He said yes, they went to see him, but they had no discussion over the problem. No. They just went to see him as the founding father of the party. And, well, uh, he had made his yeah. position clear that uh, he believed that the process of the Congress was. Uh, Yes. Above board, and then that is the verdict. He the defended people. the integrity, of course. So he spoke to us on that too. So, so, so um, you're not surprised the Russian to find Yeah. So, my father's appointment, I'm surprised you didn't say that. I was on the fire and hide when Joyce, <laughs> when Joyce uh, interrupted us. Because, yeah. yes, I mean, this is, this, is a, this, is, this is huge, and you know, he may be Davos in case Davos goes, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, but, but then, they, they, oh, Bibi, I mean, I found uh, who do moral you think? questions about my hire. I, I, I followed a comment that you said, why didn't he first ask Mr. Barrow to ask him to tell him why he sacked him and still the in, public in why national he interest. In the first place, in the yes. national interest. Yes. Why didn't he ask that before taking up this other point? Yeah, well my was on WhatsApp as no usual to defend that too. So what we will move on. Yes. My defended it, he said, Well it's it's national blah 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 ah. blah. But you can go to his Facebook and read his just case <laughs> TRRC contracts is going to be given to QTV for recording. Yeah, do you think do you, what do you think of it? They said they're going to control It's going to record all the shows. Yes, and they're going to control all the things that come out. I am there. sorry, gentlemen, I must uh, cut yeah. you off. Of course it has been quite uh, an informative one talking about political parties and congresses and we wish all of them the very best because um, it's important that national interests come first uh, now to one of um, to one of my favorite uh, segments which is the entrepreneur and you know what we do on the entrepreneur every edition of the program will profile a Gambian who has set up a business for economic growth and employment creation. And today we will be taking you to Elizabeth Juth Mendy, who is the CEO of Fly Travel Agency, making name for herself in the ticketing and travels industry. Let's watch. General Manager of Fly Travel Agency. Um, I've been in the industry for the past 18 years with a vast experience in the airline and travel agency management. Uh, yeah, this is a travel agent and it's an IATA accredited agent. Um, we offer services like air ticket sales, hotel reservation. Booking for, booking for embassies, we do itinerary planning. At a very young age, um, I inspired to open a travel agency, so I studied in UK at Hackney Community College. Um, after returning from UK, I worked for several. I worked for several travel agencies and airline. Later, I 
up to open my own family business. Challenges are not much. Um, the main one is um, we don't have enough flights leaving and departing, leaving, operating in the Gambia. We have corporate clients, government, individual, uh, parastatals, groups, NGOs. I want to expand in the area of cruise and tours. Yes, uh, my name is Francis Mendy. I'm the finance and the marketing supervisor of Flight Travel Agency Limited. Yes, uh, the customer service is very flexible uh, from the reservation um, side and the financial side and as well the marketing side. I will just touch a little bit on the reservation because once the customer comes in flight travel here, the first uh, person they got in contact is with the reservation guys. So they get to talk to them, ask them about where they want to travel, their date of travel, they facilitate that. Once they, they complete the deal, they come here, they make payment. We receive their payments and issue them receipt. They will go back to the reservation guys and they will issue the ticket for them. Um, after all we do is that we make some follow-ups. We call um, to know how was their travel, how did it go. Most of the time, if it's government, we will send them uh, a follow-up, sort of like a thanks um, note to say, okay, thank you for um, patronizing on so for so we make some of those uh, full of regarding the customer side. So the customer service is really good. Um, yeah, so far so good. Yeah, it's uh, amazing. Yeah. Um, what I would like to tell them is that to continue to use flight travel agency as their agent to facilitate um, their travel because. Always we go the extra mile, even, uh, I mean, after working hours, once the office is closed, um, still you can always call us, uh, send us an email, and we can always facilitate your travel. So even though the office might be closed, but at least we also have a home base um, travel also that we do, so we can facilitate that. So as if to say, uh, it's 24 hours actually, so the emails we can attend to them, the calls we can as well also attend to them. So I'm just telling them out there that they can always... Um, rely because we are the ultimate travel solution and they can always count on us to facilitate um, their travel, yes. Welcome back and still reminding you that this is the brunch here on Kerfatu with me, Joy Mwama. And now to one of my favorite uh, segments. I know everybody's going to say you always have every of the segments is your favorite. Of course. <laughs> Why wouldn't it be? Like these are quite interactive and educative segments. So bear with me. I am super excited to have one of Gambia's finest activists with us in the building. And he goes by the name Coach Pa Sambajau. And he's... Um, he is the vice chairman of the Democratic Union of Gambian Activists and serves 
um, and also um, a reputable member of the Diaspora Club, among other organizations that uh, Pass, Coach Pasan Bajau is involved in. Welcome. Well, thank Mr. you Gaud. very much for having me, and uh, what a nice studio. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. I know a lot of Gambians watching us today are quite interested in knowing who Coach Pasan Bajau is. A lot of times we've seen you, you know, very proactive on social media and also, um, you know, putting national interest first. Can you tell our viewers who Coach Pasan Bajau is? Well, Coach Pasan Bajau is a simple man, a citizen of this great country and... Uh, Lamin Cham will tell them Sadaga Koi Jau uh, because we've worked together for a very long time. And uh, I'm a human rights activist and uh, I have one false love and that's Gambia and that's me. Thank you very much. Now, um, we would like you to tell us, today uh, one of the major reasons we have you here is that um, we are aware that you've been part of the struggle mm -hmm. for the longest time. Yes. And um, as one that has demonstrated his interest and love for the nation, we want you to critically analyze for us where you left the fight and when the fight started, you know, to this stage that we find ourselves in, enjoying the new dispensation. What has been the transition witnessed and what would you want to share with us? Huh. My fight started before Jabbe. And uh, if Lamin is here to be a witness, I used to be a regular uh, uh, contributor to the Daily Observer, letter to the editor. Uh, my uh, use Sadaga Coach Jao, Sadaga being my middle name, Coach uh, being what everybody knows me by, and Jao, of course, my last name. Uh, uh, we started uh, Amnesty here in this country. Uh, people like myself, uh, D.A. Jao, uh, Mohdu Balde, Jibril Ba, and a host of other, other people. And uh, I became associated with DOI in 19, from its inception. And uh, of course, Jame came, and uh, I was a newspaper reporter then with the New Citizen newspaper. <laughs> uh, those were interesting times. So the fight continued until I migrated to the United States and continued this, uh, this fight up to today. Interesting. Um, there have been quite a number of talks here and there that, as you mentioned, that you've been part of um, DOI yes. uh, from its inception. Would you mind telling us if you're still an active member? And if yes, what have been the progress against its competitors? No, I'm not an active member uh, uh, because at some point, uh, there were conflicts uh, because I'm this activist and you're part of a political party. Sometimes the agendas were not the same. So I felt it was the honorable thing was to resign as a member, uh, even though I still have uh, strong ties to the party. If there were elections today, I would be voting for, for DOI. Uh, its progress uh, is very complex in that I don't think DOI had ever had the chance to stand on its own. And when I see that, people may not understand. Because when DOI started, in 1986 to, let's say, 1992, they came with a different brand of politics. And it was this politics of uh, the constitution, the economy. That was not the politics that we had. Because the politics that we knew was ANJI, Jawara, the drumming, the dancing, the Benekins, and all that. So they came with something different. So it was taking time for people to understand. Because even if you uh, remember, in 1987, they did not have a presidential candidate. 1992, CDR stood. Then the coup d'etat came. And when the coup d'etat came, there, was, uh, there were two camps all already. Because when the UDP came in, into the political fold, uh, most people saw it as an extension of the old guard because it was the NCP, PPP, GPP, the band parties that came together from this thing, Usainu took it to another level. So you had these people, those who wanted Jame to stay and those who felt that by voting for the UDP, you're bringing back the PPP. So Doi was left in the middle. And of course, that was the thing. And when Usainu did, uh, that's Mr. Dabo, better than any other presidential candidate had ever done in uh, political history, because the first presidential election in this country was 1982. 
because after 81 they amended the constitution and went from the majority uh, uh, appointing a president to a president having direct elections. Uh, so that now, now you have now a major party in the UDP. And those who wanted Jame to go now really saw an opportunity like, let's vote for Mr. Dabo so that Jame would go. So Doyle still was in the middle, and of course, 2001 elections, uh, Mr. Dabo stood again. Uh, 2006, it was a coalition that was the SNAT, the debacle that left. 2011, another coalition. 2016, another coalition. And uh, now this would be the first time, maybe the next elections, where we will have uh, the Doyle would have the chance, like all other parties, to present their uh, uh, manifestos, standalone manifestos, and all that. But what I also believe that it's his biggest achievement uh, is the amount of Gambians that it has molded. Because if people talk about a past Sambajau today, uh, I definitely would give most of the credit to the party because they've been able to instill in me uh, three things that is uh, integrity. Uh, uh, self-confidence in yourself, believing in yourself, and love for country. And uh, so to me, that is uh, the greatest achievement that the party has had. And I hope that they will grow further. Lavincha? So, yes, let's talk about Duga and its contribution uh, mm -hmm. in the, what now, generally accepted emancipation of the country. Mm -hmm. um, there were times Duga was also not spared, you know, from controversy, etc., <laughs> etc. Cetera, et cetera. How has Duga now reformed, given that people will say, well, what you've been struggling for has, has now been achieved? What is the relevance now? Because since, you, since all of you have said different political platforms, how do you combine now? Now that what you all been, what combined you now have been achieved? Well, you see, that's the mistake that people make. Yeah. Uh, Duga is now a registered uh, civil society group here in the Gambia. Uh, we have an office opposite the old uh, House of Parliament. And uh, uh, tomorrow we have a meeting with some of our members uh, here on the ground. And then on Tuesday we have meetings with other partners. Uh, Duga's objective, like I've always told people, the biggest mistake that Gambians would make is to feel satisfied that we have defeated a tyrant. That was not the objective of this fight. Because the very objective of this fight is to end so and realize uh, a, a Gambia of liberty, dignity and prosperity. And if you look at uh, our country today, yes, there is democracy, yes, the, there is freedom of expression, that's why this medium can operate and I can come here and say whatever I want to say. But the livelihood of the average Gambians still uh, is not where it's supposed to be. I was just listening to a radio program this morning and some of the concerns that they raised were that most of these farmers could not sell their crops. And this is something that we've been struggling with for ages. So Duga uh, will continue its work in partnership with uh, other civil society groups. Now, uh, I know people ask, oh, but you guys are not protesting, you used to protest. I'm saying, then you are missing the point. Because when Duga was protesting in the United States and other places, because the democratic space was so constricted that people did not have the, 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 the chance to demonstrate. But since Baro came to power, how many Gambians have demonstrated in this country? Yeah. Every single day somebody is demonstrating. Well, so I'm if I'm demonstrating, why would I go and do it at, the, at an embassy? I am coming to this country to demonstrate because it is a guaranteed right and we have a government that to some extent, sometimes they try to you know, play games, uh, respects that right. And I believe we cannot also just, because the moment we start uh, avoiding exercising our democratic rights here and exercising it somewhere, you are giving the government ideas to constrict the space. But Duga is still very, very relevant. And uh, we respect every Gambia's right. If you are Lyman Chang, part of Duga, you are UDP, that is your right. You can support the UDP. But Duga would not be transformed into a political party. And any member of Duga who forms a political party would have to uh, 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 resign from your executive committee member because then that would be a conflict. But it is a, uh, a human rights organization, an activist group that respects everybody's right and we are just moving ahead. <laughs> now, um, if I can pass it to Mustafa, um, the role of the diaspora, Gambian diaspora in the struggle against Gambia was well recognized mm -hmm. and most of the time even mentioned by the president and the government at the time. Mm -hmm. 
But at some point, we've seen that the government, people consider the government now being a little bit ungrateful or making comments that actually uh, aren't fair <laughs> with the diaspora. How do you diasporans view this? Do you think that uh, the government is now marginalizing your role or perhaps it's now uh, having now like, courage now to, to say, well, yes, we probably we can do it all by ourselves or they forgot, you know, the people who help in the struggle? Well, uh, what I think is this is a government that has become uh, too comfortable uh, to the extent that it is forgetting what brought it to power, to power and what, how it came to power. Uh, the diaspora's role uh, cannot be overemphasized. Uh, just like I always tell people who thank me, oh, they say, I say, don't thank me. If you guys did not go to vote, there would not have been a change. But uh, what we were able to do in the diaspora is to provide an outlet that was uh, helping the opposition here to work. Maybe Mr. Barros' uh, understanding of the diaspora's role is not as much as others because uh, we've worked for over 20 years with the Halifa Salas, the Usainu Dabas, the OGs, and also those people understand what we do. Uh, and I think what has happened here is... Uh, <laughs> Last year there was this fanfare, the president uh, gave a speech, the diaspora is the eighth region of the exactly. country, you know, from December 15th to January 15th, it will be diaspora month. Exactly. This year it's like, oh, we are not mentioning that. Exactly. And the reason for that is, last year people were not as critical of this government as they are today. So what I believe is it has, this government has become extremely sensitive to criticism. So my advice to them is the criticism of Gambians or by Gambians of this government is not because of hatred for anybody, but because we see that the aspirations of our people are not being met. You cannot run a country by billboards, just mounting billboards all over the place with very, very nice wording. That does not solve the problem of the poor farmer in uh, Ngain Sanjal or all these other places. So uh, I think the relationship has become, a pro become problematic, not because of the diaspora, but because of the sensitivity of, 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 the, of the government. And I want to advise Mr. Barrow and his government that <laughs> uh, please deal with it, because we are not going anywhere. Nobody is going to stop Gambians to speak their minds. And you know what, what we say on, on social media, I, I don't drive, so I take taxis. Every taxi driver that I've gotten into his or well, his, his taxi is lamenting some of the same issues that we see. You go to any Bantaba, people are talking about it. So believe me, don't just say that all oh, the diaspora. I want this government to have a listening ear. Listen to the concerns of the people. When you do that, then you'll be able to at least move this country forward. Because, hey, if Barrow succeeds, I wouldn't be the one taking the credit. He would be one touted as the greatest president to have ever existed. So take the criticisms as, you know what, these are people who are trying to help me. If you do that, then you want to be uh, trying to marginalize one group or the other. But, you know, we are here to stay. What's We're not going that? anywhere. So, so yeah, um, when you people, I mean, even in the Gambia, Gambians and Gambians in the diaspora, when they started the movement against Jambe, I mean, there were sets of aspirations that they were intending to have. Uh, want to have democracy, freedom of expression in the country, but also they were. How, do you, how much do you think, I mean, in the two year of battle uh, is fulfilled? Are we on path to where we think we, we will be heading? Yes, with concern. In that, uh, here is what I, I, I think left to this government alone they may have tried otherwise to constrict the democratic space. But what is helpful is uh, Gambians have decided to take ownership of their freedom and are not letting it go. Because there were times in our country where people uh, would be scared to say anything. During the Jawara days, people didn't care about politics. It was not it was because nobody was bothered, so it was not. You talk about constitution, most people didn't know it. I once went to a training with the police and asked them, has anybody ever seen a copy of the 1970 constitution? No hands were up. Does anyone have a copy of it? No hands were up. And this was a whole, full hall, a hall full of police officers. So it was not of concern because uh, constitutional violations were not the order of the day. 
But when Jambe came, that was a daily thing. So everybody knew constitution. constitution. That's why at one point I said that the word that would be the, that would be most used over the next three to five years would be constitution. Okay, so like to answer your question, the Gambians have refused for their rights to be taken. But this government have seen uh, very subtle messages that have been sent. Like when I had the uh, director of, is it SIS they call it? Yes, ma which is in fact SIS. unconstitutionally named because the NIA is part of the, you have to amend the constitution to change the name. But uh, when he said that social media is a threat to national security, people must be very, very careful with that statement because if the government believes that something is a threat to national security what are they going to do try to stop that and i believe i totally reject that statement because in my view there is nothing that is being said on social media that is not said on in bantabai here any bantabai you go people are talking about it we've heard uh, my friend amadba talking about you know don't push a uh, uh, barrel to the wall and all that so these messages when you hear it they are not the ones that come from democratic mind, democratically minded people. Even Barrow's statement, uh, I, I, I am more powerful than, than, than Jami because I have economic and all these things. Even though there was a qualifier, you have power, but the way it is being used. Democrats would say that my power is derived from the will of the people. Therefore, I am more powerful than the one who took the, 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 the power from, from behind the people. But if you start using uh, military, uh, uh, the security apparatus, as means of being powerful, that's a problem. So this is, this is my concern, and this is why I believe we all must be extremely careful so as not to allow an other leader to become so comfortable that they can take away rights, because they will take one, and you say, okay, they take two. Before you know it, we are back into fighting for a fundamental I mean, rights. We, we, I mean, in recent times, there has been quite a attention within the government, I mean, whether, whether it's Barrow versus his former party, or borrow versus some elements of the civil service that he think are not supporting his NDP. I mean, in the past we've seen Jambe qualifying critics and mm -hmm. as, as enemies of the country and opposition as even journalists who are doing critical work as opposition or nephews of opposition and things oh, like that. It, 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 don't you have some fear that that borrow maybe? falling into a similar trap. Oh, and of and course. Have seen the response to Ismail Azizé? And, and everybody, because that's, you see, that's the concern. I'm glad you brought that up. Because it all started, I've been telling people, be very careful, because what I do, I try to watch the language of some of these leaders and their utterances. And it is very problematic whenever a leader, you know, refer to a certain, certain section of, of the country as being unpatriotic. Mm -hmm. Because who is he to determine who is patriotic and who is not? And his estimation or his definition of patriotism is anybody who follows him calling Baro, you know, you are the greatest thing since sliced bread. So, so that's the problem. And we have seen whether it was when Halifa Salah uh, said there was no regime, mm -hmm. there was no system change. Mm -hmm. okay. And they came with a lengthy rebuttal calling him all names, you are not ready to work. And all the people were clapping, but I was like, be very careful. And what, did, what happened? You fire my party and said you did it for national interest. So what are you telling the Gambian people that my party is not patriotic enough to be in fact employed? And we see these people, even the, the, the latest firing of Alma Metal, which in itself, even though the president is the president of this country, it was done the wrong way because Alma was appointed by a board. The head of the board of governors, of, of uh, the board of uh, uh, the IOIC is the vice president. So this is a guy who decided, hey, this man is a UDP spokesperson. I, this is my own, uh, what you might call it? Assumption. Assumption. Is a, and he's calling for me to resign. So he is not somebody who, is, uh, who should be working for me. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to fire that person. We've seen the, uh, is it Mr. Cham, Yusuf Cham? Cham? When he was borough, that was fine. I'll make you an advisor. You are UDP, you are out the door. So when people look at all these things in partisan lenses, with partisan lenses, then they are missing the point. Because what we are having is a very dangerous situation. When the coalition was put together, there was an objective. Yeah. And that was to do away from the bad practices of Jammeh and start a new path. Where the civil service would be giving this uh, 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 security of tenure. Yeah. Where you will not have somebody to just get mad and say, you know what, hey, I don't like Lamy Jam, he's going to go. 
Okay, so these were all part of the thing, and that is why I think Mr. Barrow, yes, he was part of the UDP, but I don't think he was paying a lot of attention to the politics of the time. Maybe when elections were, he would go. When they have a meeting, Mr. Barrow, come to the meeting. Yes, we have, I think, $200 now in our account. Let's go to the diaspora to add some more. But anything he is, do he is doing shows somebody who may not have paid particular attention to our situation. Look at the people that he surrounds himself with. When I say Syringa, they say, but why mention him? When Jami wanted to plunge our nation into bloodbath, when the will of the Gambian people wanted to be usurped by Jami, he had a face of that usurpation. And that was Syringa, yeah. who was telling Gambians while our mothers, our sisters, our brothers, our old people, young people were packing their belongings, Absolutely. running for the first time in our history across the border as refugees. Yeah. Sirinjai was standing, telling the whole nation that Jami wasn't okay. going to go anywhere. Can you imagine the height of insensitivity yeah. to everybody that Jami had victimized for Jami to, for, for Baro to just uh, believe that, you know, it's comfort. I'm fine. Bring me Sirinjai around me. So to me, it's insulting. So I, I believe that uh, the president is going on a very dangerous path and he needs to sit back and reflect. I'm coming to that actually. Yes. You mentioned two things that I would bring you. One, you, you, when you were, you, when you were talking about uh, Barrow probably mm -hmm. being in the UDP, but not particularly au fait with perhaps what has transpired between the UDP and the diaspora people, mm -hmm. for example, or perhaps what has happened and the exact replacement Gambians need mm -hmm. in voting for him. Perhaps he's not yet on top of the, those issues. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you also mount the, uh, thinking, suggesting that there's a lot of indifference mm -hmm. to the plight of the victims of Jammu, but even the government. Mm -hmm. Not long ago, an activist said, the government is now ignoring the plight of the victims for political gains. Yep. Did you see this happening? Like, Barrow softening his stand when it comes to matters dealing with Jammu or, or all the atrocities that happen. Uh, because he wants to crave and or how to call it get support from the, you know uh, oh yes I, I last year when I came I had an interview and uh, because I visited the victim center I saw victims who do not have party tags on their heads they came from the across the polit political spectrum and people who may not even have been involved in the politics and I had their concerns. And I told them one thing, that you are more powerful than President Barrow. And the reason for that is, without your plight, there would not have been a President Barrow. Because without the victimization of the Gambian people by Yaya Jame, there would not have been a need for a struggle or the call for a coalition that would in fact bring Barrow to the presidency because then Mr. Dabo would not have been in jail, Solo Sunday would not have been yes. killed. And the any time Barrow goes anywhere, he's talked about oh 2017, 19 is going to be great. Yes. The amount of money that is coming in this country has never been seen before. The reason why the international community pledged yes. 1.7 billion dollars, I think that's what it is. Yeah, yeah. 5. 7. It's because mm -hmm. of what Gambian went through. And that is because of the victimization so, of the okay. Gambian people. Yeah. But President Barrow, who, is, who I now believe is building a coalition within a coalition. I yes. believe the bringing back of my father has nothing to do with anything but politics. politics. Okay? Yeah. I think it's now giving his back mm -hmm. to the very people and the very reason that brought him to power. Because what Barrow is interested in is how to continue to become the president of the Republic of the Gambia. And don't you think he will, he will risk losing the goodwill of the international community by, 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 by now softening his stance or, or, or not distancing himself from the people who are actually perpetrated these atrocities against the people? Well, it's being lost. It's, it is being lost yeah, yeah. gradually. Uh, some of us had had contacts with... Uh, <laughs> Baro did not even know the, 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 the road that people walk. Exactly. Uh, we talk to people yeah. and we hear concerns Absolutely. from uh, partners, partners who were ready to help this country or maybe who even pledged to help this country. And it's not only because of uh, the indifference to the, to the plight of the victims, but even the misappropriation 
of funds and our budget because misappropriation does not only stop at putting the money into no. your pocket yes. but putting it where it did not, it belong. not belong and if you look at this country but most important sir before i even go to international he is losing the goodwill of the gambian people this is a man we saw the, how he was uh, received when he came Absolutely. we saw what it was like whenever baro went to a mosque we saw how people loved this guy and we see what is happening now all of a sudden within 12 months it's like you will not even believe there were people who used to say baro is our baro yeah, yeah. now nobody wants to own baro yeah. nobody wants to deal with him yeah. he is now in fact yeah jami was not even this uh isolated, isolated mm -hmm. within 24 months mm -hmm. of his rule even though he, he had already killed people yeah. Yeah. but there were people who were like okay let's yeah, still give him yeah. chance there were people who were like that i used to have this fight with people but baro is losing that means he's, he's offending everybody no, he is because of I believe he surrounded himself with the wrong people. But I don't want to blame his advisors because this is a guy who decided he's a great grown man who has two wives. He was in England and decided, you know what? Hey, I've had it enough here. I'm going back to the Gambia to start my business. He thought that uh, I came, I had this small office, I was able to build my own business. I sponsored it, so he it's knows what he is doing. Yeah. So to me, Baro has put self ahead of nation. And that is the most unfortunate thing. And unfortunately, the only people that are suffering are the average Gambians. This is why this country is littered with beggars everywhere you go. The other day I was uh, standing uh, the Johnson of, I think, Hagan Street. I forgot the other street with somebody from the diaspora. And there was this young boy who came. Uh, and in the mail in my, I don't want to make $5. It's only yeah. Of the Gambia. yeah and, and you look at this kid. I felt bad for the kid, even though the person that I was with, you know, Halel Dunyan, their man. I was ready to do, but I said, okay, let me just uh, let that go. But anywhere you go, how do people su survive in this country? That I don't know. The people, if you don't have anybody in the diaspora in this country, oh, yeah, you are in deep hell. Deep hell yeah. You know, and it's sad. And we could have changed this. Mm -hmm. There is tremendous amount of goodwill. Goodwill, that's what we got. You know, but we are squandering it. Thank you, Mandy. People, many commentators said uh, Mr. Barrow should have delayed his political ambitions Big until time. at least. Well, you are doing, you know, without without without, without thinking that this this might be music to your ears. But people are now saying that well, if we had listened to Doy, who had said let's pursue our agenda as a coalition intact before we go to partisan politics, mm. don't you think our going into partisan politics? Just this, two months after this, the change, it resulted into this kind of thing? I think it did. People started, I think the coalition, I spoke to somebody yesterday who told me the coalition uh, pretty much uh, started dissipating uh, as soon as Barrow assumed office. Because the coalition partners made the mistake of turning Barrow into an executive president instead of a coalition president. Because Barrow would come, ah, Mr. Dabo, I make you minister of justice. And instead of saying, okay, listen, this is a partnership. Okay. Let's look at the merits of how we appoint. You'll say, oh, wonderful. Call wife, guess what? You'll be getting a new car. You know, Lamin, you're the minister of sports, even though I wish they made you minister of sports. And you'll get happy. So people started individualizing these places. Instead of, can you imagine if Barrow said, okay, listen, we all own this. Yes. We have an agreement. Uh, it is three years. Uh, the minister should be shared. And this is why I've... Uh, I, I blamed uh, Mr. Dabo Usainu, uh, to an extent on this. In fact, I told him, we had a meeting, and I told him, uh, in his face, he's a friend and, and a comrade, that the biggest political miscalculation that Dabo made was when he made that utterance in, in March. Five, I think it was years. March. Yeah, if Barrow is forced to step down after three years, I would go to court. And you, so, and you know who was sitting next to him? Uh, Ahmad Ba. My father. And my father. Right, yeah. So they were there. And uh, because to me, Ahmad was also there. Yes, Ahmad, Ahmad was also there. there. You know, because what that did at that point, it was a very tense period. We were going to call it. So people were digging their heels. Because as soon as Mr. Dabo said that, that became the rallying cry of Barrow supporters and UDP supporters. supporters yeah. All right, Barrow is our Barrow is five years. That's what the constitution said. By putting yes. UDP flags wherever it is. Yes. <laughs> and then, and then Barrow took that literally. Because Barrow also understood that the same constitution yeah. that gives him the right to serve not 
more than five years in office yeah. gives him the right to also <laughs> seek for political <laughs> office again. Yes. And this man, like I told Mr. Dabo, whatever you told this guy, mm -hmm. or I've said in so many places, whatever Baro Dabo said to Baro, Baro took it literally. Yeah. Dabo called him Moses. Yes. He said in New York he is the he Moses. Him to know us. And guess what? Barrow believes that he himself alone <laughs> was able to... Uh, the <laughs> only thing, like Pata would say, the only thing that, uh, that Barrow had not said yet is that I, I, I also parted the Red Sea by just... Uh, <laughs> so everything you tell this guy, he takes it literally. So now what is happening now, he is consolidating himself at the expense of the Gambian people. Of, of, of work that should be done. No. Even the much talk about the National Development Plan, you wonder how... It can be implemented successfully. When, it will not be. When, 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 when the well, people... You, you, you then also think... When, you, are, you, when you have now projected partisan politics, mm. you know, to be like, if I criticize any part of the NDP, then I'm not out. I'm, I'm out. I'm 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 agenda. Yeah. Yeah. So, NDP, Barrow agenda? Come on, if you do it like that... I don't think Barrow had ever read the NDP. The only... Any time Barrow mentioned it is in a speech that was written to him. Mm. So, I don't think he takes it seriously. Because you see leaders, this, the, the difference between uh, our so-called leaders and leaders of other countries, we've seen, if you are the president of the United States, now we have an idiot there. Yeah. He's as crazy as Yai Jame, yes. I call him Yai Jame on steroids. <laughs> uh, but you understand the policies of your government. You have an agenda that you will go on the media and debate. I want, like Obama would go, uh, uh, the Obama care. Yeah. This is why I believe it is important. If Barrow were to be brought here, try and have an interview with him <laughs> and ask him about what is the most interesting part in the development agenda. He may not be able to tell you because I can bet my life on it that Barrow had never read. The, 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 he might have skimmed through it, yeah. but he had never read it to even understand what is in it. So if you do not understand <laughs> what you're doing, you may not be in, in a, uh, fully, fully invested in it. But he, that's why he is ruling this country by billboards. Anywhere you go, they are mounted all over with, you know, very so, nice So on the, on the side of the positive, um, uh, on the side of optimism, is, is, is it lost? Or can't we turn the things around? I think it can be turned around. I've always said How that. How do we do that? How do we do that? You see, there is one, if there is one thing about this government that I will have to give them, uh, is that I don't know of anybody else, but they listen sometimes. I can pick up my phone and call Mr. Dabo and see what I have to say. I can pick up my phone and call uh, uh, Batambedo and see what I have to say. Uh, the list goes on. The last time I was just at Quadrangle, I said, I, let me go and meet the Minister of Sports, you know, my yeah. thing in sports. So he welcomed me in his office. We sat, we talked about the sports we talked about some of the concerns and he was like you know what believe me uh you, i have an open door policy for everything so they they listen but the problem is it is a very disjointed government God. in that the left does not know what the right is doing that's why you always have contradictions the minister of interior would say oh this is going on you go and ask justice they say we did not know anything about it and people will say oh they're pushing no but that is the reality or, 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 serious or, government so or, or the policy Police. Oh yes. The police said this is what we have found. That but the then, but then, said, no, then, this is not. Don't you case think the, maybe as Ken Wachebe would say, the centre does not hold? <laughs> no, the, the centre doesn't hold. Maybe the president who is at the centre is the one who is. The president should 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 get off sitting there and watching what everybody says on Facebook and trying to make enemies based on oh that man is not uh, in trade. You know, where were you and all that nonsense? <laughs> Serious governments, even Jame and his craziness used to have regular cabinet meetings. Absolutely. This government, they said in two years, the last time they were saying, oh, on our 12th cabinet meeting. Are you kidding me? Jawara used to have one every week, and it was every Thursday. They would have a meeting, the cabinet would come there, and if the government is go going to buy a mug, everybody in that cabinet would know that a mug would be bought by this government. But what is happening now, there is the state house, and there is the rest of the executive. The government is run by a kabudu in that state house. And everybody else, you do your thing. Yeah. And when the budget comes, they have this, uh, this, what do they call it? Uh, they just go to the same template. Put number here, put number here. Okay, this is the budget. But it's not a serious government. And that's not to, to insult anybody. Yeah. But because I don't think they are taking their work seriously. And if Mr. Barrow start acting like the leader 
of this country and not a politician who is more interested in being a president, mm -hmm. maybe things will change. Have a cabinet meeting. Jawara used to debate with his ministers. Uh, Read uh, Journey to Justice by Asan Jalo and see how Jawara used to be challenged on, on issues. And he would debate you. And he would sometimes go back and ask the justice man and say, you know what, what is your, 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 your advice on the legal thing? And the justice would say, Mr. President, I think you are wrong on this one. And he would let it go. This is the same guy. You see, Baro has something that Jawara did not have. Jawara, Baro has precedents that he can look at yeah. and say, okay, Jawara was here. This is how he did it. And the people that were with Jawara are still alive. And actually, Jawara is still, still alive and kicking. Okay? This how Jami did it. Jami's ways are the most documented ways. Then you can learn from it and say, okay, this was the right way, this is the wrong way. You know, when, now, you yeah, when the Daily Observer came, <laughs> what did they do? You remember when they went to Parliament and started attacking the Daily Observer yeah, and yeah, came yeah. with the, the media bill? They said, they, you know, these yes. people have wrecked Liberia yes. and they are coming to the Gambia. Wrecked the Gambia. Yes. Because yes. then the Daily Observer was in, engaging this uh, uh, investigative and, and journal. And you know, Jawara stood his ground. Jawara yes. said, well, <laughs> we, we have been advocating freedom of expression. There is one now. Yes. And now you want me to go back. And even when they wrote the bill, sorry, when they wrote the bill and passed it in Parliament, mm -hmm. When they took it to him, and there was a big uproar, the international community, the uh, GPU and all this, he said, I'm not signing this bill. Yeah. And Jamie came, found the bill, and added some things, added and some before we know it, the data hydra is there. I would really there. like so, 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 okay, okay. to <laughs> uh, <I would> <laughs> before you come in, because I listened to you, uh, Kinley, and then you made mention of uh, something on work ethics in terms of how people... Yes. Um, I'm quite interested in that. Now, with this government, do you think that its employees are actually going with um, going through the right path when I say that um, like the times that they go to work that you know negligence attitude I can go to work whatever time I want it's a government institution there's that what do you have um, would you ex share your experience with us and how you think um, such problem can be tackled I've been to a few offices, and the one office that I went and saw that definitely I didn't see any idling was social security. I was not on Manjang's corner, nor was I on the other side. But what I saw were people that were serious and doing their work. All the offices that I went to, of course you'll find few people working, but I, it's the same, same old, same old. You know, you come to work whenever you want. There was somebody heaming attire on the side there. You know, oh, I'm coming, Ramadan, Marseille, what if a peace be in your heart? So it's like the seriousness is lacking. And you even go to offices, I've been to offices of people, and I look around and I see cobwebs, you know, or you see dust all over the place. And you see, like I went to Board of Health, and I saw files of people. Most of them were torn. And you're asking yourself, okay, are we, are we serious? Because these are supposed to be government records. records. Records that we can come back and say, okay, in 1916, this is who was registered on this date. You know, as, but if you were to go, to go today and ask them even the records of 1980, chances are they won't be able to see it. Because everything is thrown all over the place. So there is a total lack of ethics in our, in our system. Because I believe that it is not being implemented. Because if you have a leader, if we lead by example, people will follow. There was a time, uh, Sanna Sabali, he was the craziest guy. I've always had a problem with him. But one thing I used to give Sana, because I remember that time, you know, I would pray and then we'd be sitting here at Westfield in the bead or whatever before going to work. And Sana would always pass. Around six o'clock in the morning, you'll hear the siren going to work. He would be at work until one day when he decided to call enough uh, what do you call it? Quadrangle at 8 o'clock. Anybody who was late at 8.01, 8 you're not getting in. The next, for the next, until he was removed, every day I would be out 5 a.m. in the morning, people would be out here looking for cars to go to work. Because then, and he, they, he used to make these surprise visits to offices. Uh, people, people took it seriously, but then after he left, that died. So, but as you see, that's one of the reasons why this country is not going anywhere. Because the people that are supposed to do the job, are the very people that are not paying attention to what they're supposed to do. You get a salary, you go home. So there is no accountability. And then I believe that government should instill uh, ethics, and we also have to look at our payroll. 
You cannot have an over bloated staff who may not be doing anything and continue to pay them. We have to be very bold. Listen, let's come, Lamin, here is your what, job description. Exactly. That's what we do back there. Every, every year, end of year, you will have, you will go and sit with your supervisor. Here's your job, job, job description. This is what you did right. This is what you do wrong. This is what, you, based on that, you are getting this percentage of pay raise. Mm -hmm. All right? So people will do it quarterly and all. Because when you do that, then you are telling people this is serious. But definitely, in all seriousness, people are not ethical at work. Absolutely. They don't work. Not everybody, but for the most part. And our, uh, even look at our, our, our offices. A nice office will be built today, come to, uh, in a year. Even to paint, I went to Quadrangle. Even the, the boards that had Ministry of Finance, and they are all Ministry. the paints. They, you will not even, I'm like, okay, all it takes is just one kind of paint for somebody to just put Ministry of Finance. Absolutely. You know, so everywhere is dirty, everywhere is d dusty, all the papers all over the place. People come whenever they want, leave whenever they want, and get paid a salary. But if the president does not showing them that we have to work, of course, that's what you'll have. Sorry about that. Now to one of um, the questions that you have a key follower that wants to wants me to ask this question to you, and the question reads: What's your take on the political situation between UDP and Barrow, and do you think that this can affect national development? It is affecting it, and the reason why I'm saying that is, you cannot have the vice president and the president in a field. It's not out there, but words are thrown all over the place. Because what is going to happen is these are people that are supposed to work together as a team. But knowing uh, our people, chances are there are so many files that Barrow may not want Usainu to see because he is thinking that maybe he would use it to his advantage or whatever. Because now I think Barrow is in, in a full mode uh, ready to fight to really be the next flag, flag bearer or whatever he wants to be. So I believe that... Uh, it is in the interest of the Gambian people for whatever differences Barrow and Useno have to be patched. Because the people that are suffering are those farmers who work harder than anybody and cannot sell their crops. The people that are suffering are those people who go to hospitals and share a bed. You know, so this government is supposed to move an agenda and that is the coalition agenda. Barrow should also understand that he cannot be here thinking about being president forever, you know. But yes, it is affecting uh, the government, it is affecting development, and it's not a healthy situation. As it is right now, I think I'm going to come in there. As it is right now, I mean, we know Barrow is the president and he, he's showing no signs of leaving, mm -hmm. quitting. Do you not think that perhaps it's Usainu's job that is untenable? I mean, given that, I mean, Barrow has gone outside, said something. Mm -hmm. Saying go say something different. I mean, since you have clearly there is a battle line drawn between the president and his vice president, that, that makes one's job untenable. But it's one it. Yeah, yeah but, but it doesn't matter. But probably one's yeah, job I is believe, already Yeah, untenable. I believe. I believe Usenu is sidelined, mm -hmm. and I believe uh, uh, Barrow is doing a great disservice to the country. Yeah, because the constitution we... gives Barrow the absolute powers mm -hmm. to hire, appoint ministers, and to fire them. So don't just put Usenu there and don't want to fire him because you are afraid of what would happen. Yeah. You know, knowing Usenu, he may not want to quit because if you know Usenu, he's a fighter, he will fight. Yeah. Okay. But at the end of the day, the people that are suffering are the people. So the box stops not with uh, Usenu, but with Barrow. So Barrow has the powers. If Barrow feels that, uh, like this thing he was saying, oh, uh, let me warn those in my cabinet, uh, if you are out to sabotage my government, that is the height of paranoia. Absolutely. He is just paranoid. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, Mr. President, but that's just what it is. I'm here to just say it as it is, and you know what, that's my right. But uh, to me, if I... Fatu, care Fatu, Lafi. Okay? Yeah. Uh, if Fatu is here, you're working with Fatu, and you're going to get Tongo. Yeah. That's a problem. Because you have a job to do. Yeah. Yes, so Fatu has, been has, has to be decisive and yeah. say, you know what, we either end this pettiness yes. or 
You know what? Go on, go on, Do your thing. I will do my thing. But, uh, but Baro, yeah. I think Baro is playing politics. Baro, because Baro mm. does not want the backlash. This government is so sensitive; it's not even funny. Yeah. He knows what the backlash would be, yeah. and he does not maybe want to give Usiri the chance so to go there. So he's pressuring after. him into resigning. Maybe. I think that's what he's what he's trying to do. <laughs> well, but the thing is, uh, Usiri. If Barrow is not firing Museno, and Museno himself knows he has dispute with his with his boss, the commander in chief, I mean Museno too can resign. Maybe Useno look is looking at it now. I don't have a dispute. I'm not the problem. He's Usain the problem. Always, always, always uh, but there is a dispute. That is apparent. No, there it's is. It's apparent. But now Useno had always wanted the impression. He was very downplaying that. that yes. Because what he didn't want was this. What what coach is saying that. The rest of the people felt that look, your your defense is affecting the smooth running of the government. Mm -hmm. Now, if Barrow feels that you're not supposed to see this and this file because you are not in the same wavelength, um, probably that the, the, he's becoming he's becoming more dictatorial. He's not consulting with anybody. And, and, but don't you and then think right. that is why Hussein also must go in the national interest? But you I see, mean, if if if, <sighs> if Barrow is not letting go, and Barrow is scared to fire Hussein, Barrow is trying to pressure Hussein to talk such as, well, if you don't. Resign, I will fire you. Maybe we then should also say, Well, look, I, 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 my job is no longer tenable. I'm, I'm leaving. What do you think? Okay, let me say this. If it were me, well, I would never work for Barrow. I would have resigned. Okay, maybe Useno has a different tactic and a strategy yeah. and all that, but I would, have, I, would, I would have resigned. In fact, I told people, UDP people, and they, they thought I was being negative. <laughs> when Barrow made that cabinet reshuffle. Yeah. I told them, yes, the vice president is a higher position, but in my own estimation, it's a demotion. He said it. Sir. Yes. He because was look, at, look at what Barrow did. Yeah. And it was very tactical. He removed Ahmed Usani yeah. from Ministry of Finance, not very, because he was not effective. Very influential. And then moved him to trade. trade. He removed Usainu from Minister well, of a, Foreign Affairs, another, another strategy okay, strategy and moved him to Vice President. Mm -hmm. What used to happen before that? Wherever Barrow went, mm -hmm. there was Useno on his right, Sane on Sane his, on his on left. left. So they knew everything that was happening. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So how do you make that not be the case again without sounding like this thing? You move Useno to where when you travel, he would have to he be the overseer. Take Abadu to trade where he may not be as influential. And what did he do? Interestingly, he went to the same people who were working with the government that made it necessary for us to have a coalition to remove them and said, You know what? You were so good for this country, Mamburenjai, I'm bringing you finance. And Otangara, you were so wonderful for Jame and Gambe, I'm bringing you to, to external affairs. So now he has people that are ready to do his bidding. So this is the thing. So he was able to neutralize these two forces yeah. without, you know, acting. So he, in fact, sacrificed, uh, what do they call it, mayor, the mayor yeah. and all these things to make it look like, oh, it was the problem. But yeah. you know what happened, though? The mayor used to be blamed for a lot when she was vice president. Yeah. Now, all the blame that used to go to the mayor now was straight. No, no, no. Not, not now, now it goes straight to Barrow. Barrow now. Because people are looking, okay, no, no, no. Because when, when Usain was not even there, this problem was happening. So maybe it was not the mayor. Maybe it's Barrow. So this now Barrow, the shield that he had as the mayor was the shield. Yeah. It's no more there. So now he's just a direct target. So in, in short, the, the UDP and Davo, uh, you know, emboldened Barrow to be bigger than the coalition. And now they are there to our face. It's, it's, it's now bigger than their own control now. Well, you can say that. You know, there, 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 all of them are in the same way. And I think uh, uh, this is what is happening. But to me. I think that I I think I that I think I I I I but you see, I have a problem with that, though, Why? because uh, I think if we sit and just gloat, yeah. we told them. Yeah. Now they don't listen; it's their fight. Guess what? Yeah. Like I said, mm. whatever Barrow is doing, his fight with UDP or whoever, the people that suffer are not Barrow. Barrow's belly is getting bigger. Yes. He is enjoying his super kanja and all the chances are that's what he is cooking today, mm. Saturday, and all the stuff. Mm. But the average farmer 
who cannot sell his crops mm. are the people that are suffering. So this is the thing. So we have to have, we have to force What back. role do you think that the coalition partners have now to play? Can they get together now and go to No, the they will not. They cannot. Why? Because Ahmad Ba has become Baros B. Gewil. But Ahmad doesn't care. Ahmad just loves the spotlight. And the government, of course, is not going to say anything. My party has now been subsumed uh, 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 into so Baros camp. So who's Gentlemen, left? I'm sorry. If, we're, if we were to continue, we wouldn't leave the studio today because it's quite insightful um, having you, Mr. Zhao. But before we take a leave of you, we'll quickly go um, take um, one of our segments called The Hot Spot. And this week, we'll be featuring Conte Kunda restaurant located at Bijilo. Let's watch. Haji Conte. I am uh, 32 years old, born and brought up in Farabaganda, Combo East District of West Coast Region. But uh, recently I reside at Busubi Phase 1. The name of the business is CK Tulezu. The CK means for, uh, stand for Conte Kunda because it's, it's me and my sister who established the business. So we uh, our store name is Conte. Yeah, that's why we named the place after CK. It's called Tulezu in French means like every day. That's we walk every day. Uh, we started this place in on the third of February 2018. Alhamdulillah, we are managing. Sometimes it's as as any other business, sometimes we are doing good, sometimes it's fluctuates. That's how business businesses are in the Gambia. Normally we offer a we have a bakery, we have pastry, and we have normal restaurant. The most important thing, or what is unique about this place is, like uh, if you compare our prices to other restaurants or other people doing the same services as we are, you found that you will find that, that this place is more cheaper than many places. And then another thing is like, uh, it's easily located because it's on the highway, and then uh, it's for all. Whether you, have, you are European or a holiday maker or a Gambian or, or uh, anyone from any place, mm -hmm. like it's not expensive. So it makes it it's, uh, affordable for everyone. The taste is good. We are trying our level best to satisfy our customers and to give them the best of the services. The pastry, everything is made here. The breads, uh, uh, the snacks, everything is made here. The salma bread, normally we, uh, we, we normally buy it from uh, a seller. That one, that one, like, uh, you know, uh, in any business, you have competitors. So I will not say that it's the hottest place, but as I can say that we are one of the hottest places because we have a lot of people coming here daily on a daily basis. We have a lot of customers, and then people are searching us uh, daily on our, uh, on our sites, on our Facebook page, on our Instagram page, and on, on our, our WhatsApp too. Normally, daily, we have customers, and most of our customers are Gambians or, or people residing in the Gambia. Uh, this 
place, uh, this place is uh, is in Kersere, or others we call like it's in Bijilo, uh, on the Senegambia Highway. So if you are coming from the turntable end, uh, it's after just uh, 100 or 200 meters after Baoba or after Koko Ozone, which are all renowned places. So if you are coming from the Senegambia end, it is, uh, we are almost like 100 meters after tourist restaurant. Okay. Yeah, okay. it's on the highway. On the when you are coming from the turntable end, we are on the right side. But if you are coming from the Senegambia end, we are on the left side. CK Tule Zoo is the hottest spot in town, and all are welcome. Welcome back and still reminded that you're watching the brunch here on Kerfatu with me, Joy Wama. And of course, I'm not alone in the studio. Our very own special guest is here and he goes by the name Pa Samba, Coach Pa Samba Jow. Yes. You're welcome. So now to one that you haven't, you're not expecting it, okay. but are you ready? Yep. Mm -mm. Let's see. I want you to... Ginger up. Oh, let's yeah. see if you're ready. <laughs> let's because see. Coach Samba is very tango. So let's make sure that mm -hmm. you're ready for it. So the question reads. Hmm, what a silence. Where do you see yourself in the next 10 years? Back home here in the Gambia. What can't you do without? What can't I do without? I think politics. <laughs> Sorry, kids. <laughs> But politics. <laughs> what is the one thing that people would be surprised to know about Coach Pasamba Jao? Hmm. I think I'm out there. Everybody knows. I don't know. <laughs> wow. Like, I'm not afraid of dying. <laughs> like, I am one of those who believe that if you live for 50 and die, that should be enough because anything that you've done in life for 50 years should be enough. But... Oh, wow. I'm weird. I just, you know. <laughs> you are truly weird. Yeah. <laughs> What's your favorite Gambia dish? Uh, okay. I I know Ebe is not this thing. I love Ebe, but uh, I think plazas and supakanya, and I miss my mother's cooking Aww. because she was the best. Delicious. Everybody's imitation. So. <laughs> 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 so, what's the funniest thing that ever happened to you? The funniest thing that ever happened to me. I, what, what is the funniest thing? A lot of things have happened to me. I don't know which one was the funniest. I'm trying to scratch my brain here. Can I skip that one until <laughs> <No>. I... <laughs> I don't... Maybe Lime Chan will remember something funny so that had happened to me. No, nothing well, funny happens know. during your protest. All the protests that have happened around the world. Yeah. Protests after a, a sitting president. Yeah, maybe uh, what? Uh, getting hit by uh, the Jamis NIA guys. Uh, uh -huh. But that's not, that was not very <laughs> that funny. Was funny. I was lucky because I nearly went to jail because I was going to hit and when I, I just closed my eyes one and swung, what, it was going to be a DC police officer. I would have been in jail by now. But the funniest thing, I don't, I don't know. You can remember. Maybe as far back as your childhood days. Yes. Uh, I've had you, some weird... What do you pick quarrels with, uh, etc., etc.? <laughs> a lot. I used to fight. Uh, I was not a good <laughs> fighter. You know, I would just humble and then run. But uh, I don't know. Well, I'll take that as the funniest, as someone that humbles the... <laughs> yes, you know, you're right. Yeah, and definitely. then knows at the end of the day. <laughs> definitely. That's a lovely one. So what's the most vivid childhood memory you've got? Hmm. Uh, it's not a nice one. I... After the 1981 coup, uh, a close friend of mine, Usain Ufal, and I, we went to uh, swim. We went to Usain Ufal's mother to get our money to go and buy uh, football, but it was raining, so she said, no, you got to wait until the rain is over. So we uh, decided to go hunting. We went to Jibs, Jiboton, people that know that place, and we said, oh, the river was not deep enough. So let's go to the old Joseon River. So we went there, we stole somebody's canoe. Uh, we were all stupidly sitting on one side of the canoe, so it capsized. Wow. Uh, my friend died from it. Ooh. I nearly drowned. That's why, and since then, I don't swim. I don't know how to swim. I just 
I'm like, forget it. I don't even, pools, I even hate pools. I can just watch and that, so. That's the most vivid memory of my child. I am so sorry. <laughs> no, that's all right. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's May he so rest in peace. Uh, thank you, amen. <laughs> Still on the question. Okay. <laughs> Who are your heroes? Wow, my heroes are... I love Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. a lot, and people who listen to me know that I quote him a lot. I love, love Malcolm X, I love Fanny Lou Hamer, uh, I love Stokely Carmichael, I love Halifa Salah, uh, because he's a mentor, and I believe, uh, if you know him very well, he is qualified to be called a hero. And of course, my mother, Awolo, and my father, Lyman Jow, they all passed away. I think these are my heroes. Wow, interesting. Only one of them quite a little bit portrays violent Malcolm X, though. <laughs> oh, yeah, but, and he was able to be the counter because with, with his... I by thought Malcolm X and the, the likes of Steve Bigo, Lumumba, the ones who are active, violent, and... No, he was he, he it was it was very it worked very well. That's why they took my, uh, Dr. King seriously. They had to either deal with him or deal with King, so they decided to deal with him. So, are you ready for this last but not the least final question? Are you ready for this? Yes, reluctantly, yes. <laughs> what are the three words that best describes Coach Pasama Jow? Fun going. I'm very. I'm a very. Uh, I love to have fun. And people know I'm very shy. In public, I can this thing, but I have a problem. I cannot. I have a problem looking at people in the eye for a long time. But I think that's a Gambian thing. Uh, and that I love my Musango music. Musango. Mm. Yes, I can listen to that the whole day. I, that's I, just I, me. You know that I have two of his albums in Galavar Days with my cat. NTC <laughs> <laughs> and NTC. Yep. <laughs> Thank you classic. very much, Coach Thank Pasamba Joe. It's been a pleasure having you here on Brunch, and you are my first guest for this year. So you are ah, highly welcome. You, you see? A round of applause for that. <laughs> <laughs> and the guests will be coming. I, I'm waiting for somebody to beat me. In my <laughs> You know, that be any. but so it's been a pleasure, oh, definitely being you. here. Thank I, you I thank you so guys, you guys very much. And uh, when I say that, do not est underestimate what you're doing, because uh, you are the guardian of democracy, and not only in name but in practice. Because what you are doing is the reason why Gambians are exercising their fundamental human and constitutional rights to freedom of expression and opinion. Because you are providing an outlet for people uh, to do there, and I'm really inspired by the work that you do, and uh, keep it up. Thank you very much. And your final words to all yours? Hey, still giving me a hard time. Okay, I am here on holidays. The sad thing is, it's almost over. But again, you know, I'm just human. I see things as I see them, and Gambia is nice. If you are abroad and you are in the cold, you're losing. It's almost 90 degrees here, so <laughs> <laughs> it's nice. Thank you very much. And Kiedabo, your final words? Um, <coughs> Mine, it's uh, sort of one I think um, it's been uh, amazing having uh, Mr. Jao on the show and to discuss also about issues of national interest. So, from me, I think I. Uh, yeah, Jao? equally, I think it's very inspiring to have a knowledgeable uh, guy like Pasamba who knows the political scene both back in the days and now and can even talk about the future. New Year, happy New Year to all our audience around the world. Thank you very much our viewers. It's been beautiful having you on the brunch show today and still reminding you that I remain your host Joy Mwama and keep following our subsequent shows which will be coming through. Bye for now and I still remain Joy Mwama. Buying a plot can be easy or maybe a tedious task sometimes, especially when you have so many real estate companies, agents, landowners, and even sometimes so-called landlords all calling to buy their properties. 
Getting the land is the easiest part, but owning the land with genuine documentation is a problem. We have seen unprecedented court cases of people going to court to settle land issues. If you are looking to buy a plot or a build home with no risk of stress, guys, look for the right real estate company. At EJ Investments, we don't just sell plots, we build communities. Where any plot you buy from us comes with access to water, electricity, internal roads and other social amenities. We guarantee you genuine contract documentations the moment you pay a deposit and a complete handover of your title deeds as soon as completing payment. We currently operate three projects in strategic locations, selling service plots and built homes in our estate to Jering Seafront, signing Seaview Estate and our Gunjur Seafront Coastal Highway Estate. Our plots are affordable from only $90,000 you can own a home at Agunjo C4 Coastal Highway Estate and from $200,000 you can own a home of your dream at our Sanyan Seaview and Lakeview Estate. Our two Jering Seafront Estate starts from $300,000. Plot sizes ranges from 20 by 20, 20 by 25 and 25 by 25 and we offer an option of 30% deposit and two-year payment plans on our, our estates. A beautiful home with peaceful and happy neighborhood awaits you at our project to join Seafront Estate, signing Seaview and Lakeview Estate and Gunju Stifo Coastal Highway Estate. Call our office on 4464838 or 3021056, which is also on WhatsApp. Email us or visit our website on ejinvestments.net to learn more about our projects. EJ Investments, we're fast in property.